This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. So thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, so, so uh, this seems like a very diverse audience. And since I'm the, the first speaker at this, what is intended to be a school uh, that involves holographic duality, I, uh, I felt, I think I'm compelled to give some sort of introduction to the subject. And I have to apologize to those of you who have, you know, for whom this is very familiar. Um, so this first lecture is going to be, I'm going to try to fit into the 90 minus 3 minutes uh, that we have until lunch, uh, a, an introduction to, to some motivation of this, this idea of duality between quantum field theories and theories of gravity in one extra dimension, and uh, some uh, as basic aspects of the dictionary. So I want to talk about uh, computation of correlation functions of scalar, scalar operators in the vacuum of a CFT using this machinery, and I want to talk about thermal equilibrium, and I want to talk about deviations from thermal equilibrium. So this is a, a big task. I'm going to try to be efficient. <laughs> we'll see how I do. And the reason I want to be efficient about doing this is not just uh, so as not to bore the people that have heard the story before, but also because I, I'm eager to get to the sort of juicy stuff, uh, which my second lecture will focus on a problem that I think is a physics problem, which I think is a good, a good physics problem with which to, uh, to which to apply this technology, which is systems with Fermi surfaces, many of which we don't understand. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll try to motivate this problem and, and, uh, and attempts to use holography to say something about it. And, uh, and then in the third lecture, I'm going to talk, talk about something very different. And maybe I won't even tell you what it is now. It's very different. <laughs> in particular, it doesn't involve gravity. Um, okay, so these are references for the first lecture, and so without any further ado, let me um, say what the subject is, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about two facts, which you can take, which we can take as hints for what we mean by this kind of holographic duality. We'll try to, we'll talk about these two facts, and then we'll combine them, and out will come holographic duality. It'll be great. So, so the the subject of these of these lectures is is, uh, alas, holographic perspectives on. Uh, physical systems that have extensive degrees of freedom. So what I mean by this is systems where uh, you, can, you can think of the definition at, in terms of some local information. So the Hilbert space of the system is some, at, e at each point in space, you stick some degrees of freedom, and the Hamiltonian is defined by some local information. So th these degrees of freedom interact with each other by some, intera by some interactions that uh, only involve nearby degrees of freedom. And so this includes quantum field theory, many lattice models, Classical fluids are a special case, and many other interesting systems. And uh, I think a useful analogy to keep in mind is that these systems with extensive degrees of freedom are like, uh, I don't know if they have this in Germany, but uh, where I come from, there's this thing called sod, which is, which is uh, like grass that comes in chunks that you can sort of spread onto your des desert landscape to make it into a lawn. And so, so this is what I mean by quantum field theory, in the sense that you know the sod is made up these, of these little chunks of degrees of, freedom, degrees of freedom, which are grass, which are coupled to each other by dirt to, to their neighbors. And you know, sod is sort of a universal thing that you can spread everywhere. Okay? And so as you, as you cover more land, there are more degrees of freedom in proportion to the amount of land that you cover. So I think this is a, this is a good picture to keep in mind. Um, okay, and sometimes such systems can be understood directly in terms of some picture involving weakly interacting particles. So this, so like, uh, many systems that arise in particle physics, um, which are just, you know, if you like, they're just normal modes. And uh, uh, when this happens, you can just solve the thing and you don't have to think about what happened. Um, but very often, the, there isn't such a, a change of variables that you can make to, make to make the action Gaussian. So it's not just a bunch of weakly coupled harmonic oscillators. And so you need to, some deeper understanding of, what, of how to think about it. And that deeper understanding came from Ken Wilson, rest in peace, um, that the right way to approach those sy such systems is to organize your thinking about them scale by scale. And so let's begin by thinking about some, an example of such a thing where uh, I'm just going to think of a, a cl classical system where at each point on this lattice, two-dimensional lattice, I'm going to stick a, a classical spin. And let's couple them by some, some Hamiltonian like this where the neighbors interact with each other, the near neighbors interact with each other a little less, and you know, maybe it stops at some point. And the, the right way to think about this is to introduce a, a coarse graining procedure, to, to squint at this picture and introduce a, f a family of Hamiltonians labeled by some parameter, which is saying how much you're squinting. 
which I'll call R. Uh, so R equals zero is the actual lattice definition, which is called the ultraviolet. And at each step in this procedure, you group these spins into some block spin and average over the spins within the block to get a Hamiltonian, which is a function of just the average, the, just the block spin, and by a procedure that preserves the long wavelength physics. Okay, and so this defines a flow, a family of Hamiltonians labeled by this extra dimension, um, on a flow on the space of Hamiltonians. So the coordinates of the space of Hamiltonians are these coupling constants. And if you can do these sums, these averages over the block spins, then you can derive, for example, some sort of flow equation. Some, you know, so G, say G is one of these couplings, a, a statement about how G evolves as you vary your, your, the coarseness of your rulers. And that, this derivative is called the beta function. And an, an important observation is that this, this function only depends on the value of the coupling at the scale that you're looking at. It doesn't depend on the, so if I, if I want to know how is the coupling going to vary when I'm here, it only depends on the value of the coupling there and not on what happened at the beginning and not on what's going to happen at the end. It's local in this scale direction. Okay, and so uh, I need to mention an important outcome of this point of view, which is that this flow, like many dynamical systems, will have fixed points. And the, the idea that fixed points are rare explains the phenomenon of universality in critical exponents. Namely, those are, those are properties of the fixed point, and many different microscopic systems end up at the same fixed point. An obvious fact from this description is that the fixed point theory is self-similar, right? Because we're doing this, we do this, the statement that it's a fixed point means that when we do this coarse graining transformation, we get, we get back the same Hamiltonian. And so such a thing is scale invariant. It looks like this beautiful Baraka flower. And, uh, and, uh, okay, and often the fixed point theory is also conformally invariant. So this is, we've explained one of the six letters in this acronym. Okay. Um, the story I've just told you is the, is the whole story, modulo actually doing the sums for classical systems. For quantum systems, there's, there's one more thing we need to keep track of. So in the, at this coarse graining step, when we throw away some of the degrees of freedom, in a quantum system, if we're gonna, if we're gonna group quantum spins into a group, so if I have two spins, each of them has two states, the, the, state, the, the, the pair of spins has two to the two states together, and if at each step I keep, keep all the states of the spins, the Hilbert space as a, as a coarse grain will just will grow exponentially. Right? It grows like the number of steps. The, the, the Hilbert space of each site grows like the number of steps that I've made, and this becomes completely useless because the, the Hilbert space is just too big to ever think about. And so to make this useful, you have to throw away some of the states, and you have to be clever about which states you throw away. And this, this point of view leads to what's called the density matrix normalization group, um, or more sophisticated modern versions of it, uh, like, like entanglement of normalization. And that leads to pictures like this, where not only do we keep track of this coarse graining of the Hamiltonian, so this is the same kind of picture I was just drawing, where, where this little triangle indicates that we're we're uh, blocking together these two spins into one spin, one spin, and we're evolving the Hamiltonian according to the coarse graining map, but we also need to keep track of the state. And so at each step, we need to disentangle the nearby degrees of freedom so that we end up with a smaller Hilbert space. Okay, so, so but also in the quantum mechanical case, this, this coarse graining procedure is hard to do in practice. Um, there's still some thought to, to doing physics, even after Wilson. Um, and so it would be really great if these pictures I'm drawing solve some differential equation, right? That would be pretty wonderful. We wouldn't have to, you know, actually go into the, into the system and think about what it's doing. We could just, you know, solve some equation. So, so that's a, a hope which, you know, keep in mind for a few, for a few, a few minutes. Um, okay, so that was the first fact. The normalization group is a good idea. The evolution is local in scale. The second fact that I want to talk about is, I've, so far I've been talking about systems with extensive degrees of freedom, like SOD. And I want to emphasize that a theory of gravity is not like sod. It is a different kind of thing in the, f and in the following sense. So let me tell you, remind you, or you know, talk a little bit about what we know about theories of gravity. Um, so any theory of gravity, um, I think, uh, any, let's just agree that a theory of gravity has black holes. What I mean by a black hole is a region of space from which there's no escape. I guess we could hesitate. Maybe there's some theories of gravity that don't have space. But okay, so let's think about a situation where there's like actually some relatively smoothly curved space involved in our theory of gravity. And so there are black holes. And it's a fact discovered in the 70s that there are very close parallels between the mechanics of black holes, the classical mechanics of black holes, 
and the laws of thermodynamics. Um, so for each of the laws of thermodynamics, there's some property of black holes that looks the same, that's formally the same, and in but in particular, consistent laws of thermodynamics, including both ordinary thermodynamics and black holes, requires that we assign to a black hole an entropy, which, which is proportional to the area of its event horizon in these uh, God-given units. And the reason we need to do this is that the second law in the presence of black holes is only true if we include in the total entropy, which we write in the second law, this contribution from black holes. Basically because you can throw your entropy into a black hole. And, and if you don't account for the fact that the black hole grows when you do that, this, this just isn't true. Um, and so this leads to the conclusion that a black hole is not like one of these ordinary systems where we have degrees of freedom at each point and the maximum entropy, therefore, in some region of space grows like the volume of that region. So the maximum entropy, remember, is the number of degrees of freedom. It's the dimension of the Hilbert space. And so a black hole, a system with gravity is not like that because in such a gravitating system, the maximum entropy of a region of space is actually the entropy of the biggest black hole that fits in that region, um, which, which is proportional to its horizon area in Planck units, not the volume, which, you know, in general, if I have a big region, you might think that the volume is bigger than the area eventually, uh, when the region is bigger than this, this thing that's making up the units. And the reason this is true is, is very simple. It's just that if Suppose the contrary, suppose you could have a more entropic configuration than the biggest black hole. So the entropy is bigger than the, than the entropy of the black hole. You throw, in, you throw in some stuff, whatever you've got lying around, that stuff carries energy. This is the crucial assumption. The fact that it carries energy leads, eventually, if you do it enough, will lead the system to gravitationally collapse, right? Because you're putting more and more energy into this region of fixed size, and eventually you'll form a, form a black hole but the biggest black hole has an entropy that's smaller than this, and so we violated the second law. Okay, so that's the reason that the, we, this is like the only thing we know about quantum gravity, basically. <laughs> that, that, that the accounting of degrees of freedom is different than in an ordinary system, in particular, it has the same number of degrees of freedom as a quantum field theory in, fewer, in one fewer dimension. So this, this description I've just given gives a, uh, you know, raises some very obvious questions, namely, who is this quantum field theory? Given a theory of gravity, what description should I use? You know, whose, whose bits are these? And from its point of view, from the point of view of that field theory on the boundary, what is the extra dimension? And finally, where do I put the boundary? And that, that last one I don't know how to answer, but the first two we'll say something about in some examples. Okay, so, so let's try to combine these. That was the second ingredient. Let's try to combine these ingredients. So the first ingredient was the normalization group. Ordinary systems with extensive degrees of freedom, like the quantum field theory, should be understood in terms of a picture involving an extra dimension. Okay, where the extra dimension labels copies of the system, labeled by how coarse grain we're, we're look, you know, we've, how much coarse graining we've done. The second thing is the holographic principle, which is that systems of, gra of gravity have the same number of degrees of freedom as an ordinary system with one fewer dimension. Okay, so this suggests the following thing: that gravity in a space with an extra dimension, whose coordinate is the energy scale, might be the same as just an ordinary quantum field theory. Okay, and there's and this is actually true in some examples, and. To, to make it more precise, let's focus on a special case, which is called ADS-CFT, in more detail. And that's when we focus on the case where the quantum field theory is conformally invariant. And this actually isn't much of a restriction because many, some people even like to think of the definition of a quantum field theory, a continuing quantum field theory, as a perturbation of a fixed point by some, some operator whose coupling grows in the infrared, so by a relevant operator. Okay, so what I mean by this is so a relativistic field theory, this is for simplicity, so all the dimensions look the same, which is scale invariant, so the beta function, the, the vari variation of every coupling with respect to scale vanishes for all couplings. Under, under, and so under the scaling transformation, where we scale up the coordinates, all the coordinates, so mu goes, it runs over all the coordinates, d coordinates, and we rescale our, our coarse graining parameter u, so u is, remember, the resolution with which we're looking at the system has units of energy, so it scales oppositely to the coordinates. Um, and we're gonna assume d-dimensional Poincaré symmetry. So that is, it preserves the symmetries of this Minkowski metric, right, the Minkowski line element. So translations in space and time and rotations in space and boosts. Um, and let's ask, let's try to construct a metric with one extra dimension, which preserves all these symmetries. And this is the answer. So it's, there's a, a copy of Minkowski space in here. So that's the same as this metric. But then there's this extra coordinate, u, and there's a, there's a, you know, a cost, a distance in that direction. 
And the factors of u that I've stuck here are designed to cancel the, when I, when I do this rescaling in x, the fact that u scales oppositely cancels the, the variation of this, and this thing is invariant on its own. And there's this parameter l, which has units of length, which is called the ADS radius, which we'll see what it does later. And this metric is called antidecitor space. It's completely fixed by the symmetries. Um, and, and so the point is if we rescale space and time and move in this u direction, the geometry looks exactly the same. It's an isometry. And it's a, just a bunch of copies of Minkowski space of varying size in the sense that as we vary this u, it rescales the size of this Minkowski space. Something that it's maybe not so obvious is that this metric also has a conformal symmetry, so this, which is, forms this Lie group. Um, and so actually, uh, the existence of this description in terms of this extra dimension immediately implies that scale invariance and Lorentz invariance, scale invariance implies conformal invariance. Okay, I'm gonna sometimes use another coordinate. So this is, this is an annoying thing that people who study gravity always do. They change coordinates all the time, so you get, you know, get totally lost about where everything is. So this U coordinate had units of length, as, uh, sorry, had units of energy. I'm gonna often use a coordinate that has units of length, which is just one over U with a factor of L squared there to make up the units. And the reason to do this is just that the metric looks simpler. Okay? So it looks better. You can write the whole thing in one, with one frack. Um, okay. So uh, this is a picture of that geometry that I was just describing. Each of these little rectangles is in, meant to indicate a copy of Minkowski space. And as I move in this radial coordinate, so towards larger U, towards higher energies, less coarse grained, that they get bigger. Okay? And you know, my job here is to convince you that this picture and this picture are the same. Okay? It's a family of copies of the system labeled by the coarse graining parameter. So the extra dimension is the resolution scale. And in this sense, the bulk picture is a hologram. Excitations of the different wavelengths are put in different places. So, we, so we're being led to conjecture that something like gravity in anti -de space is equal to a CFT in one fewer dimension. Now that doesn't make any sense, because gravity is, a th is, you know, Einstein gravity at least, is a, a theory where the dynamical variable is the metric. Right? So you can't just specify what the metric is. So really what I mean, uh, you know, so we need to refine what we mean when we say gravity in, AD gravity in ADS. And to do that, we need to think about the geometry of ADS a little more. And in particular, notice that it has a boundary. If you go to, to u equals infinity, z equals zero, the, the part where the size of the Minkowski space blows up, that's the uv end, there's a boundary. In the sense that massless particles propagating in the space time hit this boundary in a finite amount of time. So in order to specify what happens later, you need to, say what's, you need to specify some boundary conditions there. It's, so in that sense, it's really a boundary. And one of these boundary conditions is going to be that the geometry near the boundary looks like ADS. Okay, so the sense in which we're studying gravity in ADS is that really we're studying gravity on asymptotically antidecitor space. Near the boundary, it looks like antidecitor space. Inside, it does what it wants. It's dynamical. Okay, and notice that ADS is different from other maximally symmetric space times that you might know about, like Minkowski space or decitor space, in that the boundary in ADS is, is it's a spatial boundary. You know, if you go that way, you get to the boundary. In Minkowski space, light rays reach the boundary. It's a null boundary. And in, in desitter space, you just wait. And you get to the boundary after, you know, after all your friends have uh, accelerated away from you and you never see anyone ever again. It's pretty depressing. And it's going to happen. OK. Um, so, th so that's the idea. I want to preview some of the ingredients in the dictionary between these conformal field theory and gravity and asymptotically and to desitter space. In particular, I'm going to refer to the gravity theory as the bulk, and the, the conformal field theory as the boundary. And the basic element of the dictionary is that fields in this entity center space correspond one-to-one -to, -one to operators in the conformal field theory. And something that you should remember, or know, or I'm going to tell you, is that operators in the conformal field theory don't make particles. So unlike operators in the field theories that you read about in the introduction to Peskin, in the beginning of Peskin, where they create particles, and those particles propagate like waves that, you know, Stay like, a, stay like a particle uh, for a long time. In a conformal field theory, operators make power law soup. Right? They make some excitation that falls off in, in space and time, like some power law, because there's no scales in the problem. And so the only thing it can be is a power law. And operators can be labeled by what power law the excitations they create have, which is called the scaling dimension. And that corresponds, according to this dictionary, to the mass of the fields in the bulk by an equation like this, where the units of the mass and the bulk are made up by this ADS radius to get this dimensionless quantity involving the scaling dimension of the operator and the number of dimensions of space time. 
So notice we can already see something important, which is that a simple bulk theory, with, which only has a few fields, like the metric, maybe a scalar field, maybe a gauge field, like a theory that you could imagine usefully thinking about and like solving some equations of motion of, sorry for the dangling, is, corresponds to a conformal field theory, a weird kind of conformal field theory. There's only a few number of operators with small dimensions. So because small dimensions means small masses and units of the ADS radius, something like a rational CFT. Okay, so let's try to calculate something. A good thing to calculate in a, in a quantum field theory are co correlation functions in the vacuum of some local operators. Right, so these O's are some operators, these labels one to, one to N are some labels on the operators and they're at some position points in say Euclidean space time for now. And we can compute, all, compute them all at once if we can compute a generating functional. Right, so add to, to our Lagrangian a sum over all these operators we want to study with some, some sources that we get to pick. Okay, so these J's are going to be some you know, functions of space time that we like, we get to pick whatever we want. And ideally we'd like to compute this this expectation value of, of this modified Lagrangian for every value of j so that we can differentiate it with respect to j and compute these correlation functions. Or if you like, we could just set these j's to delta functions and source the operators only at the points where we want to compute the correlations. And a hint about the dictionary is that this perturbation, you know, we can perturb this, we can make these things delta functions. It's a perturbation at arbitrarily short distances. It's a UV perturbation. And so this should do something near the boundary of the space time at z equals zero. Okay, and so the dictionary, here's the dictionary, it's very simple. The partition function of the field theory as a function of these sources is equal to the partition function of the quantum gravity theory as a function of these boundary conditions. That's the whole thing. So any, everything else that I'm going to say is a consequence of this. Now there's a small catch, which is that I have no idea what that is in general. Right? We don't know how to compute this. We don't, even, we don't know how to define this at all. We know how to define it only when that quantum gravity theory can be approximated as a classical gravity. Or, or something like a classical gravity. Maybe sometimes there's a string theory that can improve upon this, but basically we only know how to do this by saddle point. We only know how to, know how to do this gravity path integral by approximating by some, by some stationary point of the, the gravity action. So really what I mean is, this, you know, this statement is, so I think this is always true, but, it's, but I only know how to make it useful when I can approximate this by, by doing this integral by saddle point. So solving the equation of motion of, of the bulk gravity theory with some specified boundary conditions at the UV boundary. And the source, J, on the previous slide, are just more or less equal to the boundary conditions on the field. So this finite is like the value at the boundary of the field corresponding to the operator O. So J is the source for some operator O, the corresponding field is phi, the source for, for, the source for O is the boundary value of phi. Okay, so this, this bulk action is something that I haven't told you what it is. What do we know about it so far? Well, we'd like it to have a, a solution which is anti de Sitter space. That doesn't really narrow it down that much. The following kind of action has such a solution. So there's something like a Newton's constant. This is a covariant action. There's a square root of g in the line element. And I've written it as the, the first few terms in a derivative expansion, like Wilson told us to do, uh, where the first term is just a constant, the cosmological constant. The next term is the Einstein Hilbert term. And then there's a whole bunch of other things involving more derivatives, maybe more fields that I haven't written down, which are not excited in the vacuum. And uh, if, I relate, if I set lambda equal to this combination of the number of dimensions in L, then ADS is a solution. Notice, however, that only when this L is big in some units uh, is, is the curvature of that ADS small. So only when that, so only when this, this ADS radius is large, can I, can I really think about gravity propagating in some big space time? That's when I trust this kind of description without worrying about string theory and these dot, dot, dots. And, all, and secondly, this, this G Newton here um, has units of length to the D minus one. The, the length that appears there is called the Planck length, Planck length. And gravity is classical only if this ADS radius is much bigger than that length scale. Okay, and so this kind of thing is what we get from string vacua that we understand at low energies, energies below the string scale, and, uh, and in regimes where the string coupling is small. Okay, and so the, the role of string theory is to say what, you know, what should you put in those dot dot dots in a, in a given example by studying a particular vacuum of the theory. Okay, um, another thing to notice is that large ADS radius cor corresponds, and this is something that I'm, it has to be true, uh, just by answer analysis, it corresponds to strong coupling of the field theory. 
because if it weren't if it weren't strong coupling of the field theory, then we could, you know we could just solve the field theory, and you can prove that there's no large extra dimension involving gravity. And so it, it, so clearly this must only be true when when the when the theory is strongly coupled. And uh, th this is a special case of a general principle when thinking about duality in field theory or strength theory or anything that different weakly coupled descriptions should have non-overlapping regimes of validity. So you, you know if they're really different, that you sh they shouldn't be true at the same time. Okay, so this, it's a strong weak duality in the sense it makes it hard to check, but once you believe it, it's very powerful. Okay, so let's make a check of, this, of these words I've been telling you, a quantitative check, by checking that the, the counting of degrees of freedom actually works. So I told you that the maximum entropy of some region of space-time in a theory of gravity was proportional to the area of the boundary. It's the area of the boundary in, in Planck units with a four. And that should, according to this story, that should be equal to the number of degrees of freedom of the field theory. If they're really the same theory, they should have the same Hilbert space. And so th that's true. They're both infinite. And they're both infinite for two reasons. Um, there's an infrared divergence and an ultraviolet divergence. The infrared divergence is, you know, we said, we, in the story I was just telling you, we spread the field theory over infin an infinite amount of space. Right? It's an infinitely big lawn. And so there's an infinity from integrating over all those degrees of freedom at every point over this infinite space. And there's another divergence from the fact that there's degrees of freedom at every point, and in any finite region, there's infinitely many points. And so there's also a short distance divergence. So let's resolve that by you know, imagining we put some lattice. So only put the degrees of freedom you know, every epsilon apart, and only include uh, uh, epsilon r, uh, Volume, uh, linear, vol linear length of lattice sites. And at each site, suppose that there's n squared degrees of freedom. So this, is, this capital red n squared is the name that I'm giving to the number of degrees of freedom at each site of this lattice. So the number of degrees of freedom then in the whole thing is the number of degrees of freedom per site times the number of sites. Okay, this is just the number of sites because I have this, this many sites in each, each dimension and then I have this many dimensions. Okay, so that's the counting in the field theory. In some regulated version of the field theory, let's do the counting in the, in the gravity theory. So what's the area of the boundary of antidecitter space? So the, the, the boundary of antidecitter space is at some fixed value of z. In fact, it's at z equals zero. And that blows up, right? Because if you look, plug in the square root of the determinant of this metric that you get here, you get L over z to some power, which as z goes to zero, blows up. So that's, that's the UV divergence. We're going to cut that off by only going up to some distance epsilon to the boundary, not going all the way to the boundary. And then there's another infrared divergence from the fact that we're integrating over all these transverse directions. That's the same as the infrared divergence from the infinite volume of space. So instead, let's integrate just up to r in each direction. And so this, thing, this area of the boundary then evaluates to r over epsilon times the ADS radius l to the, to the power d minus 1. OK, and so the, the holographic principle tells us that the maximum entropy in the bulk is this area in Planck units, which is this thing. And equating this with the previous thing, we can do it because the, p the power of r is the same. That's the statement that it, the number of degrees of freedom goes like the boundary in the gravity theory. The powers of r work out, and this tells us that the ADS radius in, to the right power in Planck units is equal to the number of degrees of, degrees of freedom per point. It's equal to this capital red n squared, equating these two accountings of the number of degrees of freedom. OK, and so, so this, this is combination we've seen before. This is the combination whose largeness guarantees that the gravity theory is classical. It's the coefficient in front of the gravity action, which you want to be big if, you, if you're going to approximate the, the path integral by a saddle point. And so you see, this, this saddle point approximation is valid when this capital red n squared, the number of degrees of freedom per point in the field theory is very large. Okay, so this, in some ways, this is kind of a disappointing conclusion about holography. The theories that we can describe this way with classical gravity are weird. They have very many degrees of freedom at every point in space time, okay? every point in space. So if you don't like that, you should leave, I think. I mean, if you can't handle that, you know, don't keep listening to what I'm going to say, because I'm going to say things that are true in the first two lectures, at least, for only this kind of weird system. All right? But yes, please. So what, what kind of degrees of freedom would these be? Like? Excellent question, yes. Um, so listen, nothing I've told you gives you any hint about that. And uh, string theory was very helpful for answering that, uh, despite any bad things I've said about it. Um, am I going to tell you this? Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more right on the next slide. Yeah. Um, OK. So, so, what, so where does this capital red n squared come from? And the most common example that we, we know about is the Tooth limit. 
a certain limit of a field theory where the fields are n by n matrices. Okay, so n squared is the size of an n by n matrix, and where the physical operators are traces of powers of those matrices. And this is the tough limit is, is taking large n and, and some double scaling them involving the way that they're coupled in such a way that the correlation functions of these operators, operators which are traces, factorize. They factorize in the sense that the leading contribution to their correlations are, just, are disconnected. So the leading contribution to the connected correlation functions is suppressed by powers of this capital red n squared. So the Atoph limit is designed to make this happen. And what it means is that something is classical. Right? That's what this equation says. It says that the excitations created by O have correlations which, which are disconnected. They're classical. The excitations created by O are classical. And so our job is to figure out who those are. And what they are are single particle states in the bulk. Um, OK, and it, like I said, it makes the subtle point well peaked. I should emphasize that this is different from a vector like large n limit, which is com more common in condensed matter physics, where the fields are vectors of the n components. Um, in that case, the limit is kind of less severe. And sorry, this limit is more severe and, and gets rid of more of the interactions. And quantum field theory techniques are more directly useful, and holographic duality is less useful. OK, but this is actually the best just the best understood class of examples. There are other examples where the number of degrees freedom goes like some other power of an integer, uh, but I'll always write n squared, keeping this example in mind. OK, so this, this slide is a recapitulation of what I've told you so far. <laughs> Stare at it for a minute. <laughs> OK, basically I'm telling you that this picture is the same as this picture. Fields in the bulk correspond to coupling constants in the field theory, and their evolution in this direction corresponds to their RG flow. OK, and the thing we should compute is that to compute the, quant the field theory partition function, we should solve the bulk equations of motion with some specified boundary conditions. OK, so I need to tell you a little bit more about the dictionary. So really, there's, an there's a field for every operator in the field theory. And we need to establish a dictionary between which fields and which operators. So first of all, we can organize them into representations of the conformal group. There's this notion of primaries and descendants. I don't want to talk about that. Um, Single trace operators, operators which are like trace x to the k with just a single trace, in this a tough kind of example, correspond to elementary fields. Okay, so this word elementary is always a loaded word, right? It always portrays some bias of the person who's saying it. But what I mean by it is that they're weakly coupled. What I mean by that is that at large n, the fields that create those excitations have, have factorizing correlations. OK, so some simple examples of the dictionary are fixed by symmetries. In particular, gauge fields in the bulk have an index sticking out. And we need to be able to couple them to something. They couple to some current, which also has an index sticking out. There's some term in the field theory that looks like that. And the gauge field is massless if the current is conserved. Another example is that any quantum field theory has a stress tensor. The stress tensor measures, measures it, the field theory's response to changing the space time that it's living on. So that's, that's that statement. And that corresponds, you know, any field there has such thing, the, the dual had better have an, a thing which is automatically there, which is the dual, and it's just the metric, as you might expect. And the boundary conditions on the bulk metric correspond to the, to the uh, uh, source for the stress energy tens tensor on the boundary. So the boundary value of the bulk metric is the, is the metric that the field theory lives on. OK, so here's, I said this, I said this. <laughs> if I have a scalar operator that has no indices sticking out, it better correspond to a scalar field that has no indices sticking out. And a fermionic operator better, co better co correspond to a fermionic field. OK, so notice a, a very kind of frightening thing about this dictionary, that different couplings in the bulk action did not appear in this story. The couplings in the field theory action are determined by the boundary conditions on the bulk fields. That means that changing the couplings in the bulk action is a much more dramatic change of the field theory. So the, the example of a coupling of the, I've talked about two examples of bulk couplings. I've talked about the Newton constant and the ADS radius so far, and the cosmological constant. Changing, and, and what I've told you about them is that their ratio determines n, right? It determines this capital red n squared, which is the number of degrees of freedom of the field theory. So changing these coupling constants in the bulk is, is, it's like changing the number of colors of your gauge theory. Okay, it's, it's this huge dramatic change. It's not something you can just like tune a knob in your laboratory. Okay, so the next, the next few slides are a little bit uh, heavy lifting. So, you know, stretch your shoulders. Uh, I'm gonna stretch mine. And the, we're gonna, we're gonna try, to, try to confirm this intuition that this radial coordinate u is the RG scale. And it'll be a good example of the machinery working. And we're gonna focus on, uh, 
a scalar field in anti sitter space. So you know, we want to try to evaluate this, the right-hand side of this equation. Uh, for, for the case of a scalar field, where there's some boundary condition, phi naught on the scalar field, which is a source for some featureless operator O, dual to that scalar field. And so we want to solve the equations of motion in the bulk for the scalar field with the boundary condition maybe something like it approaches that value of phi naught. OK, and so like when we were counting degrees of freedom, there's going to be some UV divergences on both sides of this statement at the boundary is equal 0. And so in anticipation of doing that, we're going to cut off the boundary like we did before when we were counting degrees of freedom. We're only going to go a distance epsilon to the boundary. So the real, you know, there's this artificial boundary at z equals epsilon. And at the end of the calculation, we'll take, we'll take epsilon to 0. OK, so, so here's this, the, the action that Wilson tells us to write for a scalar field. It has a kinetic term. It has mass. It maybe has some self-interactions. And uh, OK, so imagine plugging in the, the ADS metric into this equation. Okay, everybody imagine doing that. Imagine that you like, went home and did this. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the spirit in which I want you to take everything I'm about to say in the next few slides. Um, and we're going to study fluctuations around a particular solution of this system. So this system coupled to the gravity action that I wrote before. And notice that, because um, I didn't include a linear term in phi, phi equals 0 is a solution of the equations of motion. Phi equals 0 in the to sitter space is a solution of these equations of motion. Right, if I set phi equals 0, this thing doesn't source the metric. The stress tensor vanishes. OK, and so we're going to compute the two-point function of phi by computing the partition function in some background value of phi, and then setting phi not equal to 0. We're, sorry, and then differentiating it to phi not, and then setting phi not equal to 0. We differentiate it twice. And so that means that, in fact, only the quadratic terms in here are going to matter, because we're studying small fluctuations. We're going to study basically linear response. OK, and so, well, OK. But, Okay, so in, you can integrate this thing by parts. And you, from that, you learn that there's a boundary term in the action. And then there's a term which vanishes when the equation of motion hold. The equation of motion is just the wave equation in anti sitter space. The underline means that it's a solution of the equations of motion. And on the solution of the equation of motion, if you plug that into the action, it's just a boundary term. Okay. And our next goal is to, is to study the behavior of this, the solutions of this equation near the boundary. And we're going to derive this equation for the operator dimension delta in terms of the boundary mass. OK, so, so we're thinking about a system which is translation invariant in, in d space-time dimensions of the field theory. And so we should use Fourier space. The, these the different Fourier modes will decouple from each other. And we're studying a linear equation, so that's a very good idea. And so we're just, we just need to think about, for each k, how does, how does the, this wave function depend on z? It's just a cl classical profile. How does it depend on z? And this is more explicitly the ADS wave equation. Uh, OK, here, this is, and notice that I never had to write any Christoffel symbols. Um, OK, and so, so um, near the boundary, this equation has power law solutions because you see near, near the boundary, z goes to 0. I could ignore this dependence on the metric. And it's just a fight between these derivative terms and the mass. Okay. And so if you plug in a power law z to the delta, there's a solution if delta satisfies this equation. Okay, it's very simple. The boundary is a regular singular point of this differential equation whose index depends only on the mass. And so this equation has two roots, which look like this. And so th this is delta versus m. There's two, two roots for fixed m. And uh, <clears throat> one thing to notice is that one of them always goes to 0. z to the delta plus always goes to 0 near the boundary. And the other one kind of is bigger. So it's useful to think of that as like a source. That's the, that's the one that we want to impose. So OK, so I lied to you a little bit before when I said that the boundary value of the bulk field is the coupling. Because you know, so I just showed you that that's not a solution of the equations of motion. If phi is a constant for every value of the mass, we want to study boundary conditions that allow solutions. And so really, we sh that what I meant was the coefficient of this bigger term is the value of the boundary, is the, is the source. Okay, so and you should, you should think of this as like introducing a renormalized source. So we're pulling out some power of this cutoff epsilon, and the power is related to the scaling dimension. So this is like wave function renormalization, which, OK, I'm going to make a little more explicit here. So you should imagine that there's a term in the boundary action which couples this source to the operator. OK, so this is the source at the value epsilon. And this is the, some renormalized operator in the cutoff theory at the value epsilon. And we want this whole thing to be independent of the cutoff. Right? Just let, in our usual notion of field theory, we 
you know, try to define some renormalization so that physics is independent of our artificial cutoff. And uh, we can do this if we, if, we rescan, if we renormalize this operator by this power of epsilon, which is delta plus. Okay? And so the, using the, this fact that these roots, the sum of the roots is d, you can convince yourself that this, this power of delta plus is the scaling dimension of the operator. A more convincing demonstration of that, so this is sort of heuristic, a more convincing demonstration is simply to compute the two-point function, as well as I'll say a little bit more about that, and show that the power of x that you get is this delta plus. There's a small technical remark, which is that for small values of m, for certain values of m, which are small and like order one in units of the ADS radius, there's another, way, there's another CFT that you can define from the same bulk theory by defining different boundary conditions. I don't want to say anything else about that. Okay. So now let's think about what happens for different values of the mass. If the mass is positive, I, we just concluded that the dimension of the operator corresponding to it is bigger than d, the number of space-time dimensions. That means that, when, when you, that the, the coupling of that, of that operator in the action, just by dimensional analysis, engineering kind of dimensions, has units of mass to the d minus delta. That means that as you look at lower and lower energies, fixing this mass, at some point it, you can ignore it. Right, at some point, the energies compared to this mass are more, are, you know, you can, just, you can just ignore this coupling. This is an irrelevant coupling. On the other hand, if you look at high energies, it grows. Okay, and so that's the, that's the statement that, the, that this field will grow towards the, will get smaller in the infrared if you fix the value in the UV, and if you give it a finite value at some cutoff in the ADS, it'll, it'll grow towards the UV, you need extra data. That's dual to the usual statement that if I perturb a field theory by an irrelevant operator, I need to specify more information at short distances. It's a non-renormalizable perturbation. Okay, so it, next if the mass is zero, that means it's marginal. And if the mass, is mass, sorry, mass squared is negative, that means delta is less than d, it's a relevant operator. It's an operator that grows towards the infrared. And notice that mass squared negative, if, but not too negative, is okay. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that there's an instability. Okay, so everything we've just done about the scalar wave equation was about the behavior near the boundary. So to, to actually compute the correlation function, we actually we need to think about what the, what the solutions do everywhere in the space time. And so this is the scalar wave equation for this particular momentum mode. And let's think about the case when this k squared is positive. So that's what happens in Euclidean space time or for space-like wave numbers in, in Lorentzian space time outside of the light cone. In that case, the general solution, so you know, for more general space times, you're going to have to solve this with, on a computer, but in this case, the solutions are just Bessel functions, Bessel k and Bessel i. And okay, there's two solutions because it's a second order differential equation, and we need to pick one of them. And fortunately, in this case of Euc Euclidean momenta, <coughs> it's totally picked for us just by demanding that the solution's regular in the interior of the geometry, because one of these falls off in the interior and the other one just blows up. So this one's not so good. And so the, the, the correct solution is this Bessel K. And if you, I promise you that if you evaluate this Bessel K and plug it, into the, plug it in, into the boundary term in the action, you'll find, and take the two derivatives, you'll find that the correlation function is this power law that I promised with some specified coefficient. Okay, so I'm, I'm not gonna do this asymptotic expansion of the Bessel function in front of your eyes, it's not civilized. And so I, I've, I've prepared some extra slides of sample calculations which, which we'll put on the web page. So if you, for you to, a little help in doing that. Okay, and so I claim, this, so this is an example of, of a Euclidean ADS-CFT calculation. And this phenomenon that the, which of the solutions we should study, which of the sol solutions near the boundary is the right one to give the Euclidean physics, the fact that that's specified by regularity in the interior is a universal fact. So even, even for nonlinear perturbations, there's a statement called the Gram-Lee theorem, which uh, it's a theorem, which says that this is true. Okay, so that was, that was Euclidean, and there's, there's a very different situation if we're in Lorentzian space-time and we think about, um, about time-like momentum, so inside the light cone. In that case, there are many solutions with the same ultraviolet behavior, but different infrared behavior. And the way to figure out what, it, what, what this infrared behavior is is easy. Near the infrared of, of, of this metric of ADS, where z is big, the metric is just some number times the Poincaré metric plus z squared, plus dz squared. 
It's just flat space locally. And so the solutions of the wave equation are naturally waves. Okay, and so waves, the, and they're, they're also more exactly their Bessel functions, but those Bessel functions have an expansion which are just plane waves. Plane waves also in the radial coordinate. And so the, where this Q is related to the, the wave number. So you see when this is, when this is positive, this is, this is a wave. And so these modes oscillate near the, the, the name for the Z goes to infinity region of ADS is the Poincaré horizon. And so, you know, there's, who's to say whether the ones that go left are better than the ones that go to the right? You can take linear combinations of them. There are many solutions. And this ambiguity reflects the multiplicity of real-time Green's functions in quantum field theory. Okay, and so an important example of a real-time Green's function that you might want to think about is a retarded Green's function, which describes the causal response. And so this is an opportunity for me to uh, plug in holes in our education. And we'll, we, let's just think about linear response in quantum mechanics for a minute. So, okay, some of you will be bored, uh, but I'll, we'll do it quickly. So the retarded Green's function, let me remind you, for two observables, OA and OB, is this particular combination of correlation functions. So there's a commutator between them in there, and it's time ordered. So it's only non-zero, and the one on the left is uh, later. Okay, this is a step function. And so this, we care about this because it determines what happens to the expectation value of OA when we kick the system via OB. And an dem explicit demonstration of that fact is, is on these lines. So imagine perturbing the Hamiltonian by this operator OB with some coefficient. Then the expectation value at a later time, so this coefficient depends on time. You can make it a delta function if you like in time. The expectation value of OA is just this you know, trace of the density matrix, whatever the density matrix is uh, of, with OA. And the time evolution of the density matrix you know, wraps around this O sub A. It's this you know, Dyson formula. And uh, if we linearize in a small perturbation, this phi naught is small, then you know, this, all of these, uh, this conjugation by u turns into a commutator with, with the perturbation of the Hamiltonian. And so that's why there's a commutator. And the reason there's a, there's a theta function is because the, we turn the perturbation on only, uh, so the response can only happen after we turn the perturbation on. Okay, and so this, green, this retarded Green's function in frequency spaces, frequency space is the Fourier transform of that equation. So here's an example. Take the case where the perturbation, the kick of the Hamiltonian, is by an electric field that couples to the system via the spa the, some spatial component of the electric current. So O sub B is J sub X. And we measure, the response we measure is the electric current itself. So O sub A is also J sub X. So in that case, the expectation value of O sub A is this, you know, the same formula. Let's assume there's no current in vacuum without an electric field. Then the response of the current is just this retarded Green's function of J with J times this applied potential, which is related to the electric field this way. The de Ohm's law defines the conductivity, and this is a derivation of the Kuba formula, which relates the conductivity to this retarded Green's function of the current. Okay, so how do you do this holographically? This slide says one thing. It says that the thing you should do if you're computing a retarded Green's function is study the solution which is going into the horizon. Stuff falls into the horizon that measures the causal response. <laughs> okay. So now what do you do with the solution once you determine, the determine which one satisfies the right infrared boundary condition? Okay, the thing you should do is expand the solution near the boundary again. So this is a particular solution which not only satisfies the equation of motion, but it satisfies the correct infrared boundary conditions. And you look at it near z goes to zero, there's one bit that behaves like this power, there's another bit that behaves like this power. That's what we showed when we did an analyze the thing near the boundary. And in general, the thing is a linear combination of them with some coefficients which are defined by this equation. All of the information about the Green's function is in there. How do we get it out? So I told you you should plug, into the, plug it into the action that doesn't quite always work. Here's a slightly better trick for figuring out what to do with it. So go back to the dim past, perhaps fictional past, when you read Landau and Lisch's classical mechanics book. Okay? It's a very good book. And one thing you learn from it is that if you think about a particle in one dimension with an action like this, it's an integral over time from, two, from initial time to a final time of some Lagrangian as a function of its position in x dot, then the variation of the action with respect to the initial value of the coordinate. So think about what I'm doing. I'm fixing the, the initial time and the final time, fixing the final value, the, what the value is at the end, and I'm varying just the initial, initial coordinate. The variation of the action with respect to that is equal to the canonical momentum. Okay, this is a fact that we're supposed to know. <laughs> okay, where the canonical momentum is the derivative of Lagrange with respect to x dot. So this is something we know, and I'm gonna just change the letters a little bit. So the analog of the action is this this w, the log of the e to the e to the the log of the partition function evaluated on shell. 
the analog of x is the, the bulk field. The analog of time is the radial coordinate. Okay, so, so a mild generalization of this equation is the statement that the expectation value for the field, which, which we know is the variation of the, the you know, log of the generating function with respect to the, the source, is equal to the momentum of the field, where this is a weird kind of momentum. It's the field momentum, but with z, the radial coordinate thought of as time. Okay, so the analog of this time direction in the classical mechanics is the radial coordinate. And just the same reason that this is true in classical mechanics says that this is true in, in this context. Okay, with two minor subtleties, one is that there's this extra factor of z because the boundary value of the field is not exactly the source, rather there's this wave function normalization I talked about. And secondly, sometimes there's some, some extra bit where the momentum itself has some, has some term proportional to the source. And we conclude from this though, that away from the support of the source, the response is, is determined by this phi one. So just plugging into that formula I just showed you, you'll find that the answer for this, for this response is just this subleading fall off. So this phi one is this, I expand the field near the boundary, phi naught is the leading term, phi one is the subleading term. And so if we linearize in the source, we learn that the expectation value is you know, the source times the Green's function. The leading term encodes the source, what perturbation we're making of the action. The subleading term encodes how the system responds. And the Green's function is just the ratio. Okay. Um, one thing to notice is uh, sometimes there's a response without a source. That happens, you know, if, so if this denominator vanishes, if the system can have a non-zero value for phi one without, without perturbing it, that means that there's actually a state of the system. <laughs> uh, you know, it's something that the system could do without any external perturbation that produces a pole of the Green's function. Right, this, which, you know, uh, if you thought about linear response, the poles of the Green's functions are where the states actually are. And so this is a re reflection of the fact that the Hilbert spaces of the two theories involved in this duality are just the same. Whew. Okay, so, that, so we've emerged from this discussion of the scalar wave equation in ADS. Let's shake our brains out a little bit. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, that was too fast, okay? <laughs> um, but it, you know, I don't, um, okay. So the, 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 thing you should, the, the thing you should get from this, this discussion is the following. We're using this equation, we're using this, uh, we're, we're using this equation, right? The partition function of the field theory is equal to this e to the minus onstral action evaluated on the solution of the equations. And the thing, the thing we're just doing is figuring out how to evaluate this, okay? So it's, it's just classical mechanics. The things I was just describing are basically in jacks just with a slightly different context. Okay, so this isn't, you know, this isn't really the fancy part. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is it, thermal equilibrium follows just as simply from, a, from, from that equation I was just describing. So enter to sitter space was, is, was scale invariant in the sense that it's a solution of the, of the equations which it preserves the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. It preserves, you know, it preserves all the symmetries. That's how we found it. It's dual to the vacuum of a conformal field theory, where there's just nothing in there. Nothing's breaking conformal invariance. A saddle point for a conformal field theory in an ensemble where there's a scale, like say the thermal ensemble, would be a geometry which approaches ADS near the boundary because that's a boundary condition, but which you know breaks the conformal invariance. And such a solution for the action that I described is this one, where this this F takes this form. Um, so I claim that this solves the same equations of motion that we wrote down. This is something that you can convince yourself uh, pretty quickly. Um, it's a good exercise to check that it solves those equations of motion. And it has a horizon. So when, when z is equal to zh, z is this radial coordinate, this, this f, which is called an emblackening factor, uh, vanishes. It has a linear zero. And uh, it's a fact that uh, events that happen at z bigger than zh to the left of this horizon, the reason it's called a horizon is that they can't influence anything that happens outside the horizon. So it's exactly a, a black hole in the sense I was describing. It's a region where nothing, not even light, can escape. And uh, I claim that such geometries with horizons describe thermally mixed states. And here's the reason. Near the horizon, near z equals zh, the metric that I just wrote down looks like this. I can, you know, again, annoy you by changing coordinates to this, this variable rho squared. It's related to z in this way. And it's designed so that the metric looks like 
the, the distances in the row, rho is the distance in the radial direction near the horizon. And in terms of that coordinate, the time component of the metric looks like that. And uh, look at if so, and nothing that this thing is just going along for the ride. Um, and uh, this metric here is pretty simple, right? It looks just like flat space and polar coordinates with an annoying minus sign. And we can make it exactly flat space and polar coordinates if we replace t by Euclidean time, i t, i tau. In that case, it looks like this. It's flat space and polar coordinates, but with some funny extra kappa here. So the angle for the polar, the, you know, the angle in the polar coordinates is kappa tau. And that, for general, uh, if I let kappa tau run over all values, there's a singularity at rho equals zero. Because you know, if you uh, think about polar coordinates, if I let the, the angle do something, you know, go around some amount other than two pi, there's a conical singularity at the origin. And so, unless, so we, this forces us, if we want to have a smooth geometry, to identify Euclidean time in this way. Kappa tau is the same as kappa tau plus two pi. It's the angle in polar coordinates. If, the, if, if it were something other than two pi, there would be curvature at the tip of the cone. And it wouldn't act, in fact, not be a solution of the equations of motion. It wouldn't be a saddle point of our path integral. So we have to identify the periodicity of Euclidean time with this value, which if you evaluate what kappa was, it's this one over pi zh. It's the temperature, right? Periodic Euclidean time means finite temperature. The partition function of the field theory on a, on a geometry where the Euclidean time is periodic, trace e to the minus beta h is the thermal, the thermal partition function. There should be more nodding, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is also the temperature of the Hawking radiation. So if you study quantum fields in this background, there's Hawking radiation at this temperature. This is, in fact, the derivation of that temperature. OK, and so this, this identification on tau also applies at the boundary, right? So the metric, remember I told you that the, the metric, the space that the field theory is living on is just determined by the boundary value of the bulk metric. It's this g in here. And so up to a factor that, yeah, this is the boundary value of the metric. And so if I make these coordinates in the bulk periodic in Euclidean time, so that what I just described was a smooth solution, I have to make the, boundary, the coordinate in the boundary also periodic in Euclidean time. And so this is describing a saddle point contribution to the path integral of the field theory only when it's on a Euclidean, Euclidean time with a spe specific radius. It's only con contributing to the thermal ensemble at that particular temperature. So that is to say, the thermal partition function of the CFT, trace e to the minus beta h, which with beta is 1 over t, is equal to the e to the minus the classical bulk action evaluated on that metric I just described where ZH, the location of the horizon that appeared in that metric, is related to the temperature by this equation. OK, and so you know very well that the, part the thermal partition function is related to the free energy by this equation. And so from this, we can just evaluate the free energy, the free energy of, of the, this whatever field theory it is in the thermal ensemble, just by plugging in to this Euclidean action. and. Uh, uh, the answer is it goes like two to the fourth. Um, I've put in some coefficients here. So the fact that it, there's an L squared over G Newton here comes from uh, things I've, I've told you. But the, the relationship between L squared of G Newton, including this coefficient with some pi squareds and N squared, required string theory. Okay, so we derived a proportionality constant here. Uh, the pi squared over eight is something about D3 brains. Um, the fact that this goes like t to the fourth is not at all a surprise. Right? I'm studying a field theory of finite temperature where the action of the field theory involves no dimensionful quantities. Right? It's a conformal field theory. If there were a dimensional quantity in the action and I rescaled it, it would change. The dimensional quantity would change. And so the only scale in the problem is the temperature, and this thing, the free energy density, has to have units of energy to the fourth. So it had better go like t to the fourth. The fact that it goes like n squared is also a happy conclusion because you know this is counting if you heat up this thing it's made of n squared degrees of freedom at every point you know and, and the free energy should be extensive and so if i add more degrees of you know more points i should get an amount i should get n squared worth more of whatever i got before okay this coefficient i can't explain to you and in fact in this example with d3 brains n equals 4 super yang mills theory the, this is the coefficient at strong coupling this is, so this is as a function of the coupling of n equals 4 super Now I said it wrong. This is the coefficient at strong coupling. 
and uh, where, this where this description in terms of gravity is good, this field theory also has a perturbation expansion around weak coupling, and you can compute the free energy in that limit, and it's four th the answer you get is four-thirds as big. There's no reason for them to be the same because they're evaluated at different regimes of the coupling constant. But, and the fact that they're so similar is quite remarkable. Okay. Um, so another thermodynamic quantity that we should think about is the entropy. So I told you already that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon. In this case, the horizon is plane, right? So the horizon is at z equals zh and every value of x, every value of the position coordinate. And so the horizon area is proportional to the volume of space. And if you evaluate the area of that, of that fixed z slice like we did before when we were thinking about the boundary, you get this answer, which for these n equals four values of the couplings is, is, equal, to, is equual to this combination. And, what, and so the, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy density, which is this entropy in units of the space, spatial volume, is, is, this, is this quantity. And a nice check that we can make that, that this is a sensible description of the thermodynamics of some physical system is that this answer we get for the, for the entropy, which is evaluated just, just looking at the geometry of the horizon, is in fact the correct answer that we would get using the first law from that free energy that we derived on the previous slide, which involved an integral over all of space-time. Remember, because we got the free energy by evaluating this bulk, you know, some integral, it's this bulk action. So the first law of thermodynamics works out. By the way, there's something I need to confess here. So I made it sound like you could just plug this into this, into this action and you would get this answer. There's an, there's an, a few, there are a few important subtleties involved in that, um, involving a procedure called, well, involving boundary terms in the action. And uh, so this is one of these things that's uh, described in this sample calculation. It is a technical detail. Okay. Another check that this thermodynamics of this ADS black brain, I guess I should call it, since it's not, you know, it's not round, it's, it has a planar horizon, a check that this desc sensibly describes the thermodynamics of some physical system is that the specific heat is positive. So some of you may know that the, the, the specific heat of a black hole in flat space, a short black hole in flat space, is negative. Black holes in flat space evaporate. Right? It's an unstable thing. And on the other hand, I'm claiming that these black holes in empty center space describe the thermodynamics of some ordinary quantum field theory, which you know, you should have to put temperature, you should have to put energy in to heat it up. Right? That's what it means for the specific heat to be positive. And indeed, the specific heat is positive here. Okay, and then finally, here's a, here's a deep and important statement. The fact that um, stationary black hole solutions are labeled by very few parameters is, you know, it's something that the general relativists have emphasized for a long time. There's this thing called the no hair theorem that, you know, the idea being that, like, uh, I think John Wheeler maybe had some kind of prosopagnosia where, you know, he had to look at people's hair to recognize them or something. Um, and so, you know, bald people are all, all look the same or something. Um, I, I think that's the idea behind that name. Uh, so, but this fact about black holes, about solutions of general relativity, the fact that stationary black holes are labeled by just a few parameters, like the temperature, the charge, other conserved quantities, is dual, according to the duality that I'm explaining, to the statement that in thermodynamic equilibrium, there's just a few state variables. A thermodynamic equilibrium state is labeled by a temperature, a chemical potential, maybe some angular momentum, right? These, these statements are dual to each other, according to this dictionary. Pretty cool, right? Because this, you know, this is a fact from, I don't know, Boltzmann, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, so that was thermal equilibrium. Now I want to think about deviations from thermal equilibrium, where things actually happen. Okay. So the first thing uh, to think about is some small perturbation from equilibrium. Like imagine you stick some little thing in the background of a black hole and ask what happens. Well, the thing is going to fall into the black hole. That's dual, so that the inevitability of, you know, you sit outside a black hole and you let yourself go, you're going to fall in. That inevitability is dual to the inevitability of thermalization, right? The fact that, you know, energy falls into the black hole is the source of, of you know, is the arrow of time in thermodynamics. The fact that you return to equilibrium is, it's, it's, done a, it's gravitational collapse. And small amplitude perturbations are dual to these quasi-normal modes of the black hole, so these, uh, solutions of the equations of motion in the background of the black hole without the source, without a source. Um, the, the fact that they're called quasi-normal modes 
is the quasi is because they don't necessarily occur on the real frequency axis. They generally involve some kind of ring down, right? The, there's some decaying part of the amplitude. The frequency has a little bit of an imaginary part. They decay away and you end up back with the black hole. That's the statement that there's thermalization. Something I need to emphasize about this discussion is a very important virtue of holographic duality relative to other large n approximations that you might make in field theory, like this vector-like large n limit, which is that dissipation of the kind I've just described is built in at leading order in the 1 over n expansion. So you know, without doing any corrections to this 1 over n expansion, you can see just by the fact that stuff falls into the black hole that, that the system will thermalize. Um, and so this is a bit of a puzzle because you see, I, you know, I can be describing a closed system where I have a quantum field theory and even, you know, even in a finite chunk of space. And I'm telling you that if I excite it a little bit above thermal equilibrium, on its own, it will return to thermal equilibrium, right? Which, you know, this should be a little, you should be shocked by this. But it's the same shocking thing that I told you before about the number of degrees of freedom per point. The reason it's happening is because at each point in space, it's already in the thermodynamic limit because we've taken large n at the very beginning of the story. Okay, so at each point in space, there's some gigantic n by n matrix. And the, the excitation that we, we put into the system of this you know, finite chunk of the system is going somewhere into that matrix. <laughs> okay, so it's weird. It's very weird, but um, it's, uh, it's quite useful because it's a very simple approximation where, which includes uh, dissipation, which is, you know, for many applications, uh, uh, an important thing to have. <laughs> okay, so this was small amp amplitude perturbations of an arbitrary kind, but small amplitude. Another class of interesting perturbations of equilibrium is hydrodynamic perturbations. So that's where you know, we take the, the equilibrium fluid and make some local slowly varying boosts of that equilibrium. And we can even, well, somebody can even explicitly do that in the black hole solution. So write down some kind of black hole metric where the, the, the location of the metric is, is boosted as a function of space in some way that very slowly. And these smart people showed that in an expansion in derivatives of the temperature as a function of space and the velocity as a function of space, solutions of Einstein's equations of this form are in one-to-one -one correspondence with solutions of the Never-Stokes equations with some particular values of the, of the coefficients of the viscosity and all those other horrible, horrible things. It's not horrible. All of those other transport coefficients. Uh, Someone, I don't know who, might, might be disappointed by this conclusion because it means that holographic duality doesn't solve you know, this million dollar problem of the late time behavior of, you know, behavior of complicated fluid flows because it, you know, you, it's this, you know, it's, it maps this difficult problem to this difficult problem. Um, so these were, like, in some sense, small deviations from equilibrium. Um, a, we can also consider larger de deviations from equilibrium. And I guess, uh, uh, so two examples, both of them due to Paul Chesler, um, are the following. We, can, we could think about, for example, here's, here's uh, time, and here's some component of the boundary metric. So you can imagine that, you know, this is, put the thing in thermal equilibrium, or even in the vacuum, and then at some time decide to squish it <laughs> with this profile and see what happens. And so Paul was, is powerful enough to solve Einstein's equations. And the answer is, is this. So the, these, these three curves are the energy, the pressure par perpendicular to this, the direction in which we squish it, and the, the, thing, the pressure parallel to the direction in which we squish it. And it, you know, it does some crazy stuff, and then it reaches some fluid solution. It reaches some, some equilibrium solution and relaxes. Um, actually, with other, other protocols of squishing it, there's some more interesting hydrodynamic flows that you can see at the end of this. And uh, oh, the, the important conclusion is that a black hole forms. Right, that's the description of the equilibrium state at the end. And a very, very brutal summary of the, this result is that the thing relaxes very quickly, that it thermalizes in a time of order one over the temperature. Another much more recent development is to consider some, in vacuum, with, in, sorry, with no sources, some uh, initial conditions for the, for the, for the fluid, and then, and then let it go and solve Einstein's equations as a function of time. And it produces pictures like this, where I, I, I forget if this is a picture of the velocity profile or whether it's a picture of the shape of the horizon. Um, and you know, it's, it's some kind of turbulence and these, these smart people have observed various power laws in the, pow in, in the power spectrum. Uh, 
OK, so, so uh, this is the end of the first lecture. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> OK, so that was a summary. Let's think of that as uh, you know, that's an overview of, of what the duality is uh, about. And so now we can go back and try to unpack all of the things we skipped over. So you should ask questions. Yes, please. It's really big. Right. So, so, so. Okay. I don't know if everybody heard the question. Um, the qu the question is from the point of view of someone who wants to do condensed matter physics. How do we make it make ourselves okay with the idea that the systems we can describe this way are involve many degrees of freedom at every point? And okay. So one answer is. Uh, there's at least some subset of the condensed matter community who's willing to learn something from vector like large n limits. So, you know, if you're studying a spin system, sometimes it's useful to take a large n limit and, uh, and see what happens, right? It's not the answer, but it's n answer. And, you know, and you can try to make an expansion in one over n and, and try to get to the n equals two. Um, so, obviously, not everybody's going to be happy with that, with that answer, but I think. Uh, um, it's a control. It's a controlled limit. So isn't that spur? Is it like another one over n expansion? Yes. Yes. It's another one over n expansion. Yeah. It's you know it's maybe a little more different than just increasing the number of spins, um, in that you know you're replacing each spin with a with a matrix rather than with a vector, um, but it's an, it's another it's another controlled expansion, and um, yeah. But it's but you know the the fact that it's more different ha comes with the you know that cost comes with the benefit that it's more understandable, right? That there's there's more physics left in the limit. So, sorry, I said I said kind of the wrong thing. The, the the cost comes with the benefit that it's it's not as extreme. It doesn't it doesn't remove as much of the interactions as that as that limit. Um, for example, the fact that there's dissipation at leading order, and and also that at leading order in this expansion, operators can have order one anomalous dimensions, unlike in the in the vector like limit, where the part where the operators are nearly free. So you know, so yeah, actually, let, let me emphasize this. So in this, uh, hmm, uh, so in this discussion of the role of one over n. Um, so 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 I, I listed the things that large n is accomplishing here. So it, it means that the the correlation functions of these operators factorize. It doesn't mean, however, that their scaling dimensions are nearly free. So, so you know, the, the two-point function of this operator can, can, can be very different from those of any free field. And so um, although it's a little bit of a weirder limit, it's one where the physics is more interesting. It's, it's closer to an interacting system. Yeah. Um, OK, yeah, yes, please. Wow. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, so for nearly everything, so for everything until we got to the discussion of thermal equilibrium, everything was Lorentz invariant or or Euclidean and rotation invariant. So, oh, sorry, you're talking about the, the extra dimension. Yes. Ah, yes, it's space-like. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, yeah, that um, that was a purely formal manipulation. Yes, that's right. It's space-like. Yeah, there's a plus in front of the dz squared. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's uh, space like what's the what's the implication of the locality of the RG flow uh, equation? Well, oh, good, good. Yeah, good. This is important to emphasize. So, so um, there's a big. I should emphasize there's a big leap between these two ingredients that I sort of tried to combine between the locality of RG, paucity of degrees of freedom in gravi gravitational systems. Those two. Those two. You know. Uh, those two statements are true of you know any quantum field theory and any gravity system, but it's not true that any, you know that any quantum field theory has a simple large radius classical gravity dual. And one soft spot in the discussion is this, what, on what scale the physics is local. So the fact that the the um, the RG equation is local in scale is true, but that's a but it's a long way between that statement. And the idea that we should describe the physics in, the, in this extra dimension in terms of an action, which is, an in, which is just a, you know, which is a, a lo integral of a local Lagrangian, where you know, there's, it's, you know, it's really, really local, 
local dynamics in this extra dimension. And so, but that's, that's, the, that's the hint that it's giving. So, no, 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 I, but by local I mean that I can describe the dynamics, I can specify the action for the system as an integral over one copy of the space-time of some Lagrangian which is a functional of the fields at that point in space-time. So both in time and space. And so, you know, the, the, the space direction of that is that, you know, you can write a Hamiltonian which involves only close neighbors, right, where it's a sum over terms involving only close neighbors. Yeah, but in general, you know, there's, there's a very important dot, dot, dot here. And in general, you know, this expansion is, you know, for, for uh, most quantum field theories, you know, the, probably there's some kind of dual, but it's not one where you can ignore the dot, dot, dots. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Yes? Simply speaking, necessary to have the horizon in the graduate science to describe the graph of the finite Okay, good. The question was whether it's strictly necessary to have a horizon on the gravity side to describe finite temperature. Um, okay, so I guess, okay, it depends what you mean by finite temperature. Um, <laughs> actually, this is, a diff this is a very difficult question, and it's re it relates to this business called the firewall controversy. Because, <laughs> um, you know, so describing this um, thermal equilibrium, right, saying that the density matrix is e to the minus beta h, is saying you know, the system is in a mixed state. Right? There's a non-trivial density matrix, not, you know, not a projector. The density matrix is not a projector onto a single state. And um, so you know, I told you that this equilibrium black hole solution corresponds to, it's the saddle point corresponding to that, that ensemble. Now you might, now on the other hand, we expect that even if we start with a closed system in a pure state, but a very highly excited pure state, that many of its properties look like thermal equilibrium, right? If you, you know, let it go for a long time, let it, uh, uh, suppose, suppose it's a stationary, a stationary state, but a highly excited one, that, you know, uh, it's a true fact that if you measure just local observables, right, like uh, correlation functions of operators in some small region, or, you know, energy behavior of the energy, relationship between the energy density and the, and the local pressure, that it'll look just like thermal equilibrium with some appropriate temperature. I guess this is called the eigenstate thermalization conjecture. And so, you know, you might think that even in, a, in an excited pure state, the dual description should look something like this black hole. Um, it's not clear whether that's true. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think I shouldn't say more than that, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but maybe, did, did that answer your question, actually? Because maybe, maybe you were asking a, a more practical question than one that yeah, gets... Yeah, if, if, if it's possible to repeat more or less the same game, like, but to find time, you can have time without the horizon, or, or, or presence of the horizon is necessary... Ah, time. ah, okay, good, 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 good. So good, so, so I'm sorry, yes, yes, good. There's a very, very precise answer to this question. So I was describing here the... the um, saddle point of the gravity theory that contributes to uh, the problem, the, the, the description of the, the partition function of the field theory on infinite space, inf infinite, you know, R3 is space, and Euclidean time is periodic. Um, and in that case, I claim that this is, you know, for reasonable gravity theories, the solution of the bulk equation of motion with those boundary conditions is this. Another question I could ask is instead, put the theory on finite volume. Put the theory on a three sphere times Euclidean time. Okay, so this is you know, an equally well posed question. It describes the thermal equilibrium of the CFT and find it, you know, on a sphere uh, at some temperature. And in that case, actually, so then in that case, the physics depends on, on you know, there are two scales, right? There's the radius of the sphere and the temperature. And the physics de can depend on that ratio. And in fact, only for temperatures sufficiently large is the black hole the right dominant solution? There's another solution which competes with that solution, which is, which is just empty entity sitter space with periodic boundary conditions in time. That's right. And so, uh, so this, observ this, this phenomenon was discovered actually by Hawking and Page long ago, long before ADS-CFT, and was interpreted by Witten in 1998 as a, as a, a phase transition, as a, as a phase transition from a state of the field theory where 
there are very few excitations, which is this low temperature state when the dissolution is not a black hole, to one where, there, where the, you know, the free energies have these order n squared behavior, where it, which is sort of a deconfined phase. It's deconfined in the sense that you excite all of these degrees of freedom of the gauge theory. Yeah, good. Okay, more questions. Yeah. Have you, you like to sort of you mentioned this example, it's very sort of shake the system very hard mm -hmm. and eventually sort of it, it equilibrates at the original temperature. And you said basically it's a, a ah. consequence of the fact that they have this huge number of degrees of freedom. So can one do something like, I mean, at next to leading order and see that eventually perhaps the system equilibrizes but at some elevated temperature? Well, no, sorry. The initial one, or? sorry, I think I, I, may have, I may have said something confusing. In this example, actually, the, the, the initial condition is, is in vacuum. So it's at zero temperature. And the final state is actually some, at some finer temperature, which, ah, which depends on how much energy you put in. Yeah, so no, you can heat it up okay, by so doing this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, Yes, please. Sir. So, if you go back to the slide where you made some more, the uh, things going to the rest of your layer, and then off, uh, we have where does the energy go? Where does the energy go? Yeah. That seems to imply that this is less than that, this is a vanity, which is uh, not true, right? Um, no, that's right. No, but it, so this, yeah, the, so, okay, the confusion is where does. The three is the problem with the discussion. No, no. But okay, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a, that's of course true. Um, but in the one over n expansion, it will not. Yes. You know that's that's. You, I, I'm sorry. You're totally right. But the the point I was trying to emphasize was about the large n expansion. So this large n expansion is different from that one. It, I, I, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's a virtue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, let me emphasize Severe's point. So, he's, so, I may have said something misleading that, you know, even, even when the system is in a finite volume, if it's in the continuum, it, there are infinitely many degrees of freedom. It will, you know, reach something that looks like thermal equilibrium, even if it is a pure state, actually. <laughs> right. Um, the, but um, in the vector like large n expansion, for the reasons that I was saying earlier, it's, it's very much like a free system. And at leading order in the one around expansion, that does not happen. It does not thermalize. And whereas in this large n expansion, it does thermalize at leading order. And so this, so it's you know it's it's a great thing for that sort of application. Yes, please. Are there examples known of what the one over n corrections do to this dissipation? One over n corrections do to it. Ah. Um, Oh, oh. oh, good, good, good. So, so the question is about the 1 over n corrections to the statement. So, right, so, so Subir, you said that it makes it seem like it doesn't conserve energy. And that's actually true in the sense that at leading order in 1 over n, you're neglecting, so where does the energy go? In the bulk, it goes into the black hole. If you put energy into a black hole, the black hole grows. In this leading order approximation in 1 over n, we're ignoring the growth of the black hole because it's, it's of order 1 over n squared. Sure. Of course, of course. No, no, but I'm talking about an order one amount of energy going into a black hole. In this, it's, it's a small correction, and we're ignoring it. And that's the sense in which the energy is not conserved. No, I'm talking about just like small perturbations. Like, you know, how is it that the uh, retarded Green's function can have, you know, poles in the upper half plane instead of did I say the right plane? I'm sorry. I should lower. Yeah, the pole's in the correct half plane so that it goes away. <laughs> uh, at leading order in this expansion. Where does the energy go? And the answer is it goes into the black hole, right? That's some, you know, inf even that infinitesimal perturbation. That the amount of energy that goes into the black hole is infinitesimal. But it's also of order 1 over n squared. The correction to the size of the black hole is of order 1 over n squared. And so this is one thing that you would want, you would want to see to include 1 over n squared corrections to the statement. You'd want to see that the black hole grows when you throw something into it. Or something with an energy of order one. So the 
Oh, you can explain to me later how it's possible for you to disagree with that statement. <laughs> okay. Yes. Ah, good. So the question is whether you need string theory to see the black hole grow. And the answer is no. No, so certainly this is something you could study in classical gravity. And of course, as Sabir is saying, if you throw in an amount of energy of order n squared, then you can see it just by solving the Einstein's equations. That's totally true. Yeah, leading order. If you throw in a, you know, a large amount of energy so that it competes with the, yeah, which is what's happening in this example, right? That's why the temperature is bigger at the end. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, that's, I'm not, I don't really know much about it, but that would be like a prime correction, is that true? Uh, was that that's the story. Sorry? That's the story. So is that conceivable from any point of view that prime corrections would, would destroy dissipation? Okay, so, so, the, so the, the question is, is alluding to so something I, I got tricked into mentioning, which is, <laughs> which is this idea that um, pure states of the field theory should be dual to, to states of the bulk that don't have horizons, right? Because, um, well, I, at least I, I showed some evidence that the presence of a horizon corresponds to a mixed state of the field theory. And so there are various, various ideas related to uh, the black hole information problem that, you know, maybe the correct des description of, of black holes in string theory is, uh, is that you know, the black hole solution is coarse graining over some collection of states that solutions or something that don't have horizons, uh, which are called fuzzballs sometimes. Um, and it's a difficult question to ask what happens when you throw something into that. And I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 